Thanks, Marla. Good morning, everyone. Here are my disclosures. Um, I have one other disclosure. In the last 12 months, I have not spoken to any Russian diplomats or <laughs> oligarchs. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about uh, dermatologic manifestations of IBD, and depending on the study you look at, the, the prevalence of these ranges from 2 to 34 percent, and we're going to be talking primarily about erythema nodosum, pyoderma, psoriasis, not only the real psoriasis, but also the psoriasiform uh, like reaction to anti-TNF agents, and then we'll talk a little bit about some miscellaneous disorders, and at the end I'll have a couple slides on uh, dermatologic cancers. So erythema nodosum is really the most common dermatologic manifestation. This can occur in 15 percent of IBD patients, slightly more common in Crohn's disease than in ulcerative colitis. And you've all seen this. You get these uh, deep but tender nodules, usually on the shins, typically, uh, but you can get them on the arms and trunk, uh, uh, rarely. Uh, for some reason, it does occur more common in commonly in women than in uh, men, uh, and it, there tends to be a correlation, not exactly, but a correlation with colonic disease. So patients with either Crohn's colitis or ulcerative colitis are more likely than, say, uh, Crohn's ileitis. And in general, this is a lesion that correlates with the underlying IBD activity, and you uh, treat it by treating the underlying IBD. So it's, a, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, and again, here are the the classic manifestations of the red tender nodules on the, on the, uh, the shins. Um, however, don't be, conf you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, uh, but if you're seeing a Crohn's patient, just realize that there are other things that can cause erythema nodosum, including TB and these fungal infections, Yersinia, Bichette, sarcoidosis, and then a variety of medications, so you need to keep that in your uh, differential diagnosis. Um, pyoderma, uh, this can be a quite nasty lesion. We've all seen, you know, terrible cases of this. This uh, is basically a neutrophilic uh, inflammation, typically on extensor surfaces, but it can occur anywhere, anywhere where trauma can occur. And if you think about it, you're more likely to bump your legs than, say, bump your arm, and I think that's simplistically why we see more pyoderma on a person's legs than, than anywhere else, but also, in a peristomal area, again, because of that uh, trauma area. There is less of a correlation between pyo uh, pyoderma and the underlying IBD activity as opposed to enodosum. And so you will see patients where you think that their IBD is quiescent, and yet they still have pyoderma. Um, and you can see the classic lesion starts off as an erythematous papule and then it'll start ulcerating, and then you'll get this sort of undermining border. It'll turn purple, um, classic lesion. Um, when you uh, biopsy these, it's very nonspecific. It's just going to show uh, neutrophilic inflammation. Sometimes they can get super infected, and so uh, the dermatologist will sometimes prescribe antibiotics as well. And again, here's a peristomal lesion on the left, and then uh, a classic limb lesion on, on the right. Uh, this can occur in perhaps 2 percent of IBD patients, again, more common amongst women than men, uh, slightly more common in ulcerative colitis than in Crohn's disease, as opposed to erythema nodosum, where there's a slight pr predominance in Crohn's. Uh, African Americans are more likely uh, to get this uh, family history of ulcerative colitis, pancolitis, we talked about peristomal involvement, and then if you have other extraintestinal manifestations, you're just statistically more likely, so things like ocular involvement or erythema nodosum. Uh, the, the treatment is to avoid trauma. Uh, there might be a role for some debridement, but if you're aggressively debriding it, you're only going to make this worse, and uh, obviously you're going to refer these patients to dermatology for their input. They'll sometimes prescribe oral steroids. Uh, sometimes cyclosporin, sometimes anti-TNF therapy. Uh, you'll also see them use t topical tacrolimus. Uh, and then don't forget the old trick up the sleeve is Dapsone in the patients who don't have uh, GP60 deficiency. Um, and then we talked about these other immunomodulators. Um, these are just some induction agents. Um, 
Again, steroids, so let, let's say you're having trouble getting them into dermatology, at least you could get the ball rolling by putting them on high dose steroids or perhaps cyclosporin or an anti-TNF. I, I think in my own practice, I'd probably be going with an anti-TNF agent to, uh, to treat this. Um, aptus ulcers in the mouth. This can be quite disabling for some patients, and there's a group of patients who get this that you suspect they have Crohn's disease, and try as you might, you can't find it. And so I've worked a lot with our uh, dermatologists who are oral dermatologists, and we have this group of patients that we think have Crohn's. We can't find it anywhere luminally, and it's all in their mouth. And, and, and I have found that they do well with anti-TNF therapy. But another trick up your sleeve is Dapsone. Dapsone is a great drug for uh, these types of oral manifestations. Metastatic Crohn's disease, kind of an unfortunate uh, Mnemonic, I think patients get worried when you say metastatic Crohn's disease, but this is basically cutaneous Crohn's disease, and it can occur in a number of areas. I think most commonly in the perianal region is my experience, and it may or may not parallel the underlying IBD activity, and treatment would be typical um, IBD meds. Uh, metronidazole for the perianal lesions might help, but again, not a lot of um, evidence-based data there. Sweet syndrome, I think of sweet syndrome in patients who present with a rash and a high fever. And this is a little confusing because sometimes it's due to the underlying IBD, but I've also seen it occur as a side effect of azathioprine. So there are rare reports of sweets being caused by azathioprine. So you have to keep that in your back of your mind if you um, have a patient who presents with this. Uh, typically, you treat this with corticosteroids and uh, treating the underlying uh, bowel inflammation. Um, we'll spend a little bit of time talking about psoriasis. So psoriasis is an inflammatory disorder. It has a variety of manifestations. Uh, and don't forget, there's already a weak link between Crohn's and psoriasis, such that about 4% of Crohn's patients, irrespective of anti-TNF therapy, 4% of Crohn's patients will get psoriasis. And, and remember, there are a few uh, gene mutations that um, Crohn's and psoriasis have in, have in common. Um, and you can see with anti-TNF therapy, however, which is ironic because anti-TNF therapies are a treatment for psoriasis, you can see this paradoxical reaction. And it can manifest itself in so many different ways. Um, it can happen in up to a third of patients on anti-TNF therapy. In my experience, not that high, though. Uh, the incidence rate has been estimated at 5% per year, um, and it can occur with other immune-mediated conditions for which people are on anti-TNF therapy. Um, part of the problem is this is a lot of this is just based on retrospective studies, and um, you know we have to take that with a grain of salt. Here's an example of a study: 900 patients getting started on anti-TNF therapy typically didn't happen right away. The median time to onset was three and a half years. And you can see it manifested itself as an eczema-like uh, uh, presentation, uh, oftentimes as a palmo planter. So when they get it on their, their, their palms and soles, uh, and you can see a variety of manifestations. Uh, sometimes you've probably seen patients with the scalp and where there, there can be significant alopecia along with the uh, terrible scalp rash. Um, there seem to be some risk factors here. Cigarette smoking, more likely to happen in Crohn's disease, more likely to happen in women, and uh, more likely to happen in uh, overweight or obese people. Uh, less likely to happen if you're on a concomitant immunomodulator and ulcerative colitis. There's been some debate about whether people with, quote, super therapeutic, unquote, anti-TNF levels are more likely to get it, and the initial report suggested that that was the case, but then subsequent reports have come out, and when you compare people with psoriasiform reactions and people who don't, and compare median drug levels, they're the same. And so I don't think high drug levels really uh, contribute to this, but there's still a little bit of conflicting data in that regard. So basically, the way you treat this is you, you have the dermatologist treat the way they would normally treat psoriasis. And bottom line is if they can control it with topical agents and it's not unreasonable for the patient, not too onerous, 
then I think you can continue the anti-TNF therapy and just go ahead and treat the psoriasis. It's when, you, when, when the dermatologist is pushing back and saying, you know, this is really difficult to control, or the patient's saying, this regimen's too complicated, I can't do it, or there's side effects, then the treatment is really stopping the anti-TNF agent. So again, if you don't have to stop the anti-TNF if you get this, because the dermatologist may be able to control it. Many of these patients are still continuing to have benefit in terms of their Crohn's or their UC with the anti-TNF agent. So the bottom line is only when the dermatologist says, no, we can't control it, that's when you have to stop the anti-TNF. The problem is, is when you start another anti-TNF, the chance of seeing this happen again is at least 50%, if not higher. In my experience, anecdotally, I think it's close to 100%. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. It might take three years on the second anti-TNF, but it, it, it's going to happen again. And so this is a patient where nowadays you want to think about ustekinumab. If they develop this, ustekinumab would be a logical uh, treatment, especially in a Crohn's patient, but I think even in a, in, a, in a UC patient it wouldn't be unreasonable. So again, work with the dermatologist, let the dermatologist do their magic, so to speak. If they can keep it under control, continue the anti-TNF. If they can't, then you look at, okay, was the anti-TNF helping? If so, consider switching to another anti-TNF, but nowadays you have the logical um, uh, step of going to use to Kinumab, and so that would be a very reasonable option. So just speaking briefly about dermatologic uh, malignancies, uh, these are probably increased at baseline for melanoma. There's a slight increase, and we'll talk about that, and then there's, there might be a slight signal that certain medications increase that risk, and certainly with non-melanoma skin cancer, basal cells and squamous cells, we do see an increased risk with uh, immunomodulators. So we have uh, Sid Singh, who was a former fellow, who's now at UCSD, did this meta-analysis with us, and we looked at population-based studies that had looked at cancer risk, specifically breaking out melanoma, and we found in this meta-analysis that there was uh, roughly a, um, a 1.4 times increase, or a 40 percent increase, in the uh, relative risk of melanoma in IBD as a whole, so irrespective of medications. When we looked at cohorts in the pre-biologic era, comparing to cohorts in the post-biologic era, there was no difference in that risk. So we think that the risk was not mediated through the use of biologics. It's, it's something else. And so there may be some underlying immunologic uh, disorder that predisposes people to this. We don't completely understand that. Um, the SASAM study, uh, remember this is the large French cohort that detected that risk of lymphoma with immunomodulators also looked at skin cancers as a secondary analysis, and this is breaking people up into ongoing thiopurine therapy, previous thiopurine therapy, or never thiopurines. And you can see that there were some differences and they were age-related. In other words, the patients who were older were uh, more likely to see an increased risk, and that makes sense because age is always a risk factor for, for most cancers. Um, the interesting thing here is that even previous use of a thiopurine is a risk factor for non-melanoma skin cancer. So it, it, it feels like there are some alterations that are occurring, uh, perhaps in the DNA of these patients. And so unlike the lymphoma story, where when you stop the thiopurine within months, your lymphoma risk goes away, with non-melanoma skin cancers, that risk persists. And so in your patients that are on azathioprine or mercaptopurine, you should probably be counseling them to see a dermatologist once a year, tell them to do the usual uh, sun protective thing. You're here in Texas, so you, uh, you know about this more than I do. Uh, you know, the uh, you know, sunscreen, wide-brimmed hats, all that stuff. Okay, so here's the question about melanoma and anti-TNF therapy. So this was a study using a big commercial claims database called the LifeLink um, Health Plan Claims Database, looking at a 12-year period, over 100,000 patients with IBD, and there were four controls per IBD. So you're talking about 400,000 controls. And within this, you could detect a slight risk that patients that had been on biologics had an 80 percent 
elevated risk, so 1.8 times elevated risk of uh, melanoma overall. And then for patients with non-melanoma skin cancers, the risk was associated with thiopurines. Um, and then when you broke this out by subtype, you can see that th that risk was slightly higher in the Crohn's patients, the melanoma risk with biologics, and then for um, thiopurines, it was in both, but again, maybe slightly higher in the Crohn's patients. And it's hard to know what to do with this information. Melanoma is a relatively rare cancer, so again, if you take a, a low number and you multiply it by 1.8, it's still a low number, and I think that's the way you have to sort of counsel patients. I, 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 when I talk to patients about cancer risk with anti-TNFs, I mostly talk about lymphoma. I don't really talk about melanoma separately. It's just not, I don't think, as, as a looming an issue, if you will, with patients. And so um, I think you have to tailor that to uh, your own practice. So um, to, to, in conclusion, there are multiple dermatologic manifestations that can occur. The most common are erythema nodosum and pyoderma. Again, treating the underlying IBD usually will help, and specifically for pyoderma, anti-TNF therapy looks like a good option. Uh, don't forget about the rare manifestations. We usually talk about those top two, but there are lots of others, and the ones that are probably most common are sweet syndrome and metastatic Crohn's disease. And for paradoxical psoriasis, let the dermatologist do what they can. If they can't manage it, then it's time to stop the anti-TNF. And um, I'll stop there and happy to take questions. Thank you.